Welcome back after the lunch break. I want to just say a word about where we are going to go, uh, not only this afternoon, but but from here. The focus this morning was evidently on Richard and ecumenism, Richard as teacher and mentor. Uh, this afternoon, we're going to build on that premise that has already been alluded to, which is that Richard did not spend a lot of his academic life sitting and writing articles or books. Right? And that's not a criticism, because what he actually spent his time doing was infinitely more valuable. He spent probably half a day correcting one person's paper and providing such copious notes and advice that they themselves went on to do tremendous things that they wouldn't have been able to do had he not done that or drawn the picture that Father Basil talked about, you know, uh, and so forth. Or he spent so many hours just mentoring, spending time in relationships, building up other people. We heard all of that um, this morning. But it's not to say there isn't a tremendous academic output. It's just embedded in people. It's embedded in his students. It's embedded in the people who had an opportunity to hear his lectures and to, to benefit from that um, the mentoring and guidance and, and so forth. And so if we are to capture all of that, the thought is that we need to get the people who were influenced, impacted by Richard's work to write things down, uh, to and indeed to pursue their own academic work, but note how Richard's influence, his fingerprints are all over, you know, that work. So this afternoon, we have a little bit of a foretaste of that. We have a series of presentations from people uh, who have been influenced by Richard's work in iconology, hermeneutics, historiography, theology, so on. But the, the goal is that we will, in the fairly near future, gather these together into fuller shape than you'll be able to hear this afternoon, um, along with other works from other people so influenced, and to put together what is um, no longer te technically a festrift, which is the kind of volume that this would be if the person were still uh, with us, but the Germans have a wonderful word for this, Gedenkschrift, I think is how it's said, a memorial uh, volume. And so we're already talking to potential publishers of such a thing, and some of the contributions we have this afternoon will be part of, of that venture, but more besides. So if you know other people, or if you weren't inspired to do something today but want to be able to contribute something in the future, please talk to us. And that will be one further way of showing how Richard has truly influenced all of these domains in theology, history, ecumenism, and beyond. So. To that end, we have the honor and privilege this afternoon of starting off with the person who mainly is known to us through all of Richard's lectures in iconology as my protege. <laughs> we always wondered, <laughs> who is this mysterious figure? Well, wonder no longer, because we have in our midst the Reverend Dr. Evan Freeman, Assistant Professor and Hellenic Canadian Congress of BC Chair in Hellenic Studies from Simon Fraser University, who will in extremely Richard-esque fashion talk to us about experiencing ivory pixites. Thank you, Father Jeffrey. Thank you, Masha. I also want to thank uh, Lisa and Richard's family. Uh, it's a real honor to be able to speak to you today. Um, let me start with just a few personal recollections about Richard before I get into my uh, larger talk. I met Richard as a seminarian in 2007 or 2008. Vespers had just ended. I was waiting to kiss the icons and leave the chapel. My eyes wandered up to the large mural icons that adorn the chapel's ceiling. And as I looked, I heard a voice beside me. It was Richard, who I'd never met before. And he said, you take my class next semester, I'll teach you how to read all these icons. I did take Richard's class the next semester, and I learned to read the icons in the chapel. And after that, I took as many of Richard's classes as I could. His classes were addicting. We spent hours talking about icons projected from his old slide projectors. His classes sparked a curiosity in me that I've been trying to satisfy ever since. I returned to seminary two years after graduating with my MDiv to pursue a THM, but really to take more classes with Richard. Richard's classes were not easy. There were two camps 
among the seminarians, those who avoided Richard's classes because of he assigned way too much reading, and those of us who agreed that he assigned way too much reading, uh, but we couldn't help but keep taking his classes. Richard offered his students practical maxims, like how do you get to Carnegie Hall in practice? Uh, and he offered us somewhat less practical maxims, like never forget anything. <laughs> he expected a lot of his students, I think because of how deeply he was invested as a teacher. He actively revised his syllabuses almost weekly throughout the semester. He returned term papers at even short reflections with extensive feedback, as Father Jeffrey just mentioned. Often this was in different colored inks, so you could tell that he read through your paper several times and used different pens to, to mark it up. And his devotion to his students didn't stop outside the classroom. He organized field trips to museums and academic conferences, and he was always willing to chat with students over coffee, uh, around campus, or at the library. He really loved and believed in his students, I think sometimes more than maybe we deserved, and we came to love Richard and the subjects he taught us. When I finally moved on from seminary, Richard remained a supportive mentor and a dear friend, and I miss him. Years after taking Richard's classes, when I myself began teaching, I learned about student-centered pedagogy. I learned that as a teacher, I should avoid fashioning myself as the sage on the stage who dispenses wisdom from on high for students to passively, passively absorb, but instead I should strive to be the guide on the side, supporting students as they actively build their own knowledge. Now, of the many teachers I've had over the years, Richard had more claim than most to the title sage. He was the most widely read person I've ever met with expertise across several disciplines, but despite all his wisdom, he rarely lectured, at least in his iconology classes. Instead, he ran all his classes like seminars, putting the students at the center. He didn't tell us what to think about icons, icons or primary sources, but he challenged us to directly engage with them ourselves. And so when I began learning about effective pedagogy, I realized Richard had been modeling it for us all along. Richard wrote many letters of recommendation for me over the years. And the last letter he wrote for me was for the position I now hold at Simon Fraser University in Burnaby, BC. And I like to think that I followed Richard's example, not only in my career path, but also in my path from the US to Canada. I remember Richard recounting an episode uh, when he presented his US passport at the US border when he was coming down to teach uh, at the seminary in New York. And the American border guard said to him, welcome home, sir. And in a typical, typically Frank Richard way, he responded, Canada is my home. I could fill my time uh, talking to you uh, and, and recounting um, anecdotes that show what a great teacher and friend uh, Richard was, but I know I'm preaching to the choir with this crowd. And I think Richard would want me to get to some iconology. Richard often remarked that iconology was the top predator among the subjects taught at seminary since it demanded a synthesis of all the other subjects, the Bible, liturgy, history, and so on. So in the time I have left, I'm gonna read a short academic paper, bear with me, uh, which I think Richard might have liked since it combined some of these subjects. And I hope that it models the kind of iconology that Richard championed uh, in which close looking can lead to new insights about the past. Several round ivory boxes, each cut from a section of elephant tusk and decorated with carvings survive from late antiquity. The conventional term for this type of box is pyxis, although these boxes were not historically called by this term. Scholars have searched in vain for references to these ivory boxes in written sources that might definitively tell us what they were called or how they were used. Based on style, most have been dated between the fifth and seventh centuries, and scholars have variously identified them with North Africa, Gaul, Syria, Palestine, and elsewhere, although their precise origins are really hard to pin down. Some 50 boxes or fragments feature Christian imagery, mainly biblical scenes from the Old and New Testaments, and less commonly images of martyrdom. Based on their carved iconography, scholars have long supposed that several of these ivory boxes were used to hold the Eucharist perhaps for a reservation and communion at home or on journeys, or to bring communion to those unable to come to the divine liturgy. 
More recently, Stephanos Alexopoulos has argued that these ivory boxes may have been used in church by those who did not wish to receive the Eucharist directly in their hands, apparently out of fear or piety, as described by Canon 101 of the Quinisex Council or Council of Trello, held in 691 or 2. In response to this practice, Trello 101 ma mandates that Christians receive communion directly in their hands rather than in receptacles. And I'll just read this highlighted bit. Those who, to receive the divine gift, present receptacles of gold or another material and through them enjoy the privilege of the spotless communion, we do not accept in any way, since they esteem soulless matter which we handle more than the image of God. Alexopoulos argues that the ivory boxes, or at least some of these ivory boxes, were used for this purpose, since their production between the 5th and 7th centuries seems to align with the admonition of Trello, and since their size and materials would seem suitable for the task. Alexopoulos does not, however, discuss the iconography on any of the round boxes and declines to discuss which boxes in particular might have been used for this function. So I want to try to identify a few examples of images that may support Alexopoulos' proposal and consider how uh, the iconography on these boxes would have shaped worshippers' experiences of the Eucharist. The midwife Salome appears on a round box at the Boda Museum in Berlin, along with the Annunciation and the Journey to Bethlehem. A similar depiction of Salome appears on, a, an, on an ivory box in Vienna, which is thought to be a Carolingian copy of a late antique model, indicating that the Berlin box uh, was not an isolated example. On the Berlin box, Salome stretches forth a withered hand toward the Christ child who lies in a large manger. The image illustrates an episode recorded in apocryphal accounts of Christ's nativity. In the Proto-Evangelion of James, Salome questions the virginity of Mary immediately after the birth of Jesus. She declares that only a physical examination of Mary will convince her of Mary's virginity. Mary assents to Salome's examination, but the Proto-Evangelion of James recounts how Salome is punished for her unbelief. Salome cried aloud and said, I'll be damned because of my transgression and my disbelief. I have put the living God on trial. Look, my hand is disappearing. It's be being consumed by flames. But she repents and is saved by holding the Christ child. A messenger of the Lord appeared saying to her, Salome, Salome, the Lord of all has heard your prayer. Hold out your hand to the child and pick him up and then you'll have salvation and joy. Salome approached the child, picked him up with her with these words, I'll worship him because he's been born to be king of Israel. And Salome was instantly healed and left the cave vindicated. This same episode is recounted in the Latin gospel of Pseudo Matthew, but in this account, Salome is not healed by touching Christ directly. Uh, instead, quote, she touched the fringe of the swaddling clothes that covered him and right away her hand was healed. The Berlin box situates the viewer in the uncertain moment after Salome has been punished with a withered hand, but before her salvation. For late antique viewers, this image must have called to mind these apocryphal accounts and served as a warning against faithlessness and unworthy touching. Several visual elements focus the viewer's eye on Salome's hand in particular. Salome lifts her withered right hand upwards with her left, breaking the boundary of the top of the manger that frames Christ, while also gazing intently at her withered hand. Additionally, in all three scenes on the ivory box, figures gesture upward, seemingly toward the contents of the box. The Virgin with her weaving at the Annunciation on the left, the Virgin again on her journey to Bethlehem on the right, and Salome at the Nativity. These gestures, I think, may suggest a connection between the images and the contents of the box. Notably, key figures such as the Virgin have been omitted from the Nativity. Instead, the scene centers on Salome and on the Christ child, who lies in a towering manger that seems to mirror the form of the box itself. The manger has been rendered with a sense of perspective that implies the viewer is looking down into it, I think in similar way that the user of this box must have looked down into the box and its contents. As a result, it is tempting, I think, to interpret this box as a Eucharistic container like those described in Trello 101, with the Virgin gesturing toward the Eucharistic bread within the box and Salome serving as a cautionary tale as she reaches toward the Christ child in the manger. 
And the tactile experience of holding such a box decorated with relief carvings must have repeatedly drawn the user's attention to the iconography on the box and its emphasis on touch. The miracle of the multiplication of loaves and fishes appears on at least three surviving boxes. A well-preserved box at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, which is dated to the sixth century and may have been produced in North Africa, depicts Christ on a throne blessing the loaves and fish. You can see that on the image in the image on the left. Two baskets of bread rest on either side of him, and apostles encircle the box with heaps of, of loaves held in veiled hands. Images of the multiplication were fairly common in late antique art, often alluding to the Eucharist. At the sixth century church of Santa Polinaria in Nuovo in Ravenna, for example, the image of the multiplication appears on the north wall near the altar, uh, where it is accompanied by other Eucharistic images, such as the wedding at Cana, Jesus praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, and the Last Supper. If the box at the Metropolitan was used for the Eucharist, it would have established a mimetic relationship between the biblical miracle of the multiplication and the contemporary celebration of the Eucharist. The worshiper, I think, stepped into the shoes of the apostles, receiving the bread as from Christ himself. And again, the tactility of the relief carvings must have repeatedly brought the user's attention back to the iconography on the exterior of the box. Because the miracle of the multiplication describes the apostles distributing the multi multiplied loaves and fishes to the multitudes, such boxes adorning, uh, adorned with this motif would have worked well, I think, for the task of bringing the Eucharist or blessed bread to those who could not ten, attend church. And since biblical accounts of the multiplication describe a surplus of bread uh, after feeding the multitudes, such a box may also have been used to collect and bring home the Eucharist or other blessed bread for worshipers to reserve and consume later. A similar image appears on a partially preserved box at the British Museum dated between the fifth and sixth centuries uh, and possibly produced in Egypt or Syria, which illustrates the prophet Habakkuk bringing bread to Daniel in the lion's den. This episode is recorded in chapter 14 of the extended book of Daniel. The angel of the Lord took Habakkuk by the crown of the head and carried him by his hair. With the speed of the wind, he set him down in Babylon right over the den. Then Habakkuk shouted, Daniel, Daniel, take the food that God has sent me. On this box, on this box Habakkuk and the angel hurry toward Daniel. Much like the apostles on the Metropolitan box, Habakkuk's veiled outstretched arms are laden with a pile of bread. A basket with what appears to be more bread also rests nearby. As with boxes with a multiplication, the appearance of bread on the British Museum box may suggest a Eucharistic function. Once again, such a box would have established parallels between holy figures from biblical texts and the worshiper who used this box. And much like the figures of uh, on the Metropolitan box, the angel on the British Museum box seems to gesture upward toward the contents of the box, connecting the iconography on the outside with whatever was held inside. The story of Habakkuk being transported by an angel to feed Daniel seems fitting for bringing communion on a journey or bringing communion or other blessed bread to those who, would, who could not come to church. Now, a recurring detail on these boxes with the multiplication and Habakkuk, which also appears on other ivory boxes, is the veiling of hands. Veiled hands were common in late antique and Byzantine art. Generally, figures cover their hands when approaching holy figures, such as Christ, or when offering, receiving, or holding holy or important objects. But there are also textual sources that describe worshipers veiling their hands for communion. In the West, and especially in Gaul, women apparently veiled their hands to receive the Eucharist. Um, we have this text from uh, Caesarius of Arles, dated, uh, who died in, in or around 542, which says, when they wish to communicate, let all the men wash their hands and all the women bring clean linen cloths on which to receive the body of Christ. Not long after, we have this canon from uh, the Synod of Auxerre, perhaps uh, held in 578 or 588, which similarly states, a woman who is not permitted to receive the Eucharist in her bare hand. And then in the East, the fourth century Ephraim the Syrian seems to refer to a similar practice when he states, your handmaids receive in a veil from the cup of life, a drop of life. 
These references to communicants veiling their hands may represent a distinct practice from the containers mentioned by Trello 101, or they may represent another manifestation of the same impulse to avoid touching the Eucharist directly with one's hands, in which case the depiction of veiled hands on ivory boxes may indeed point to the practice described by Trello 101. Images of the communion of the apostles may illustrate the same practice since they sometimes show apostles receiving communion from Christ with veiled hands, as on the sixth century Rhea pattern, which is preserved at Dumbarton Oaks in Washington, DC. And perhaps the only artwork thought to depict round ivory boxes, like the ones I've been talking about, uh, shows them being held by angels with veiled hands. An ivory plaque uh, preserved at the Musée de Cluny in Paris, which is dated to the sixth century, uh, and which may have been produced in Constantinople, shows Christ flanked by Peter, Paul, and two angels in the upper register, which you can see on the left there, uh, and two angels approaching a large cross with round containers held in veiled hands in the lower register. What might this image of the angels approaching the cross with boxes represent? I don't know. The Eucharist? The true cross? Something else? For our purposes, I think it's significant, though, that the image combines veiled hands, veiled hands with what appear to be the round ivory boxes, suggesting that depictions of veiled hands on the ivory boxes are not coincidental, but may have been directly related to the function of at least some of these boxes, perhaps the very function described in Trello 101. Let me conclude. Several decades of scholarship on round ivory boxes illustrate how difficult it can be to pinpoint the origins and functions of small portable objects that have been displaced in their original contexts. Without primary sources or donor inscriptions to provide further clues, we're left with the affordances of the objects themselves, their materiality, and their iconography. The repetition of motifs on several boxes suggests that they may have been produced in a series and that their meaning and function likely depended largely on the interventions of individual users. Nevertheless, the recurrence of imagery suggesting Eucharistic functions cannot be overlooked. But the question remains how exactly such boxes may have been used in connection with the Eucharist, particularly since they are not attested in liturgical sources or ecclesiastical inventories. Unless further material or textual evidence is discovered to shed further light on these ivory boxes, our analysis remains necessarily cautious and speculative. This talk uh, seeks to build on Alexopoulos' recent proposal that these boxes were used as the receptacles uh, for receiving communion described in Trello 1, 101 by analyzing the iconographic motifs that decorate their outsides. Such motifs may have been utilized to highlight the potential dangers and blessings of touching and consuming the Eucharist. The veiled hands gesture that appears on several surviving boxes may correspond with the late antique practice of veiling hands to receive communion, and perhaps also the practice of receiving the Eucharist in receptacles. I hope that this short talk has illustrated some of the potential of iconographic analysis uh, for understanding historical functions and experiences of material culture objects, uh, while also, and most importantly, uh, remembering the legacy of Richard Schneider as a scholar and a teacher. May his memory be eternal. Thank you, Evan. Uh, we're going to continue with the iconological theme. Um, I would now like to invite uh, Kirillos Kelada to talk to us about iconology and the Copts, some remarks and a way forward. I'm uh, currently in the MTS program uh, in Orthodox Christian Studies uh, here at Trinity College. And uh, when I was considering applying uh, for the program, my uh, father in confession uh, told me, well, you better hurry up and enroll uh, because iconology is a big thing for you and Professor Schneider seems like he might retire soon. And uh, sure enough, I uh, was very fortunate to be able to attend the uh, final uh, semester of iconology, which uh, Professor Schneider uh, taught uh, here in uh, the program. And uh, I have to say that it completely flipped all of my thinking about iconography uh, upside down. And the the little maxims uh, that that you mentioned that he uh, that he taught um, are something that I'm going to carry with me um, for uh, for the rest of my life. Um, so 
Professor Schneider was, uh, properly speaking, a Byzantinist, um, but uh, as a member of the Coptic Orthodox Church, uh, many of the principles which uh, he taught uh, are very much applicable to um, the Coptic tradition of uh, iconography. And so I'm going to present a little summary of uh, where we're at iconographically uh, as Copts um, and the things that we've inherited and uh, what the insights of Professor Schneider um, might uh, tell us about how we can uh, map out a way forward. So the uh, reviver of uh, contemporary Coptic iconography in the 20th century uh, is the man you see on the slide, Isaac Fanous Youssef. His dates are 1919 to uh, 2007. He had studied architecture and was teaching art in uh, Cairo. And uh, there had not been much uh, production of Christian art in Egypt uh, since the French uh, occupation. Fanous was also uh, an established uh, artist. And uh, I'll read to you um, a little bit about uh, his life in his own words. Um, so he says, in 1965 and 1966, a grant from the World Council of Churches allowed me to study restoration of antiquities at the Louvre and Byzantine and Russian iconography at the Saint Sergius Institute in Paris under Leonid Uspensky. He insisted while I was in residence and later by correspondence that I paint in the Russian style, but came to appreciate the Coptic style when I sent him copies of my icons. Fanus is also closely acquainted with Paul of Dokimov, who he says taught him the theology of beauty while he was in Paris. After completing his studies and returning to Egypt, Fanus set out to extract the formal principles of Egyptian art in order to establish a school of Coptic art at the Institute of Coptic Studies at the Patriarchate in Cairo. Um, and so here we have to say that if Fanus was ancient Egyptian visually, um, he was certainly Russian theologically. And it is crucial that the revival of Coptic iconography at his hands in the 20th century um, be considered uh, as, in some ways, um, an outgrowth of uh, the Paris School and the uh, Institut Saint Serge. And so, for better or for worse, all Copts who do iconography today are in some way uh, inheritors of Uspensky's theology. And many of you will remember um, that uh, Professor Schneider was very critical of uh, Uspensky's work, and uh, those criticisms certainly uh, stand. I wrote the paper like everybody else. And um, some of these uh, shortcomings, um, I think, are going to be discussed here uh, in light of um, Professor Schneider's iconology uh, in order to see uh, what the next step might be for Copts um, in iconography. So this is uh, Fanus and uh, Uspensky. And this is him in his workshop um, much later in life. Most of you are probably familiar with the work of Leonid Uspensky. And this is the early work of Isaac Fanus um, from 1967. And he's in the beginning of formulating his visual language. And we actually have this triptych and another similar one of Christ here at the Coptic Museum of Canada um, in Scarborough. And this is some of his early work uh, as well in Alexandria, his first commission when he returned uh, to Egypt. It looks quite Byzantine uh, very early on. And then he slowly begins to formulate uh, a visual language, which is, um, uh, in, in his view, uh, as purely uh, Egyptian uh, as uh, possible, which is a statement we are certainly going to look at a bit critically. Um, he worked in mosaic as well, um, and even in stained glass um, in, uh, in Coptic churches in Egypt and around uh, the, the world. This is his later work in the 90s, uh, which I consider, you know, one of his great um, masterpieces. So, Fanus saw his work as being a part of 
the return of Egypt to its Egyptianness. The expression in Arabic was Rugua Masri ila Masriyatiha. This is a very classic uh, nationalist um, way of thinking, um, and it makes sense for the political climate of Egypt at the time. In short interviews, Copts who had immigrated to Los Angeles between the 60s and 70s and who had commissioned icons from Fanus in the 90s when he was working there said that they felt like they had acquired a piece of Egypt, which reminded them, excuse me, which reminded them of back home. This is peculiar since they had not grown up in Egypt with anything resembling Fanus's work. During this time, the Coptic Church was experiencing a historical revival in religious education, liturgical activity, uh, and pastoral care. Panous was often commissioned uh, by the great figures uh, behind this growth, though, this, though his project was not accepted by all and is looked at uh, with some suspicion by many Copts until today. So um, this is uh, Fanus uh, next to uh, the priest, and that's Pope Curlis the sixth in the middle. Um, and then this is him much later in Los Angeles with His Holiness Pope Shenouda the third. Now, Isaac Fanus died in January fifteenth of two thousand and seven, and this was during a time when a lot of the great spiritual leaders of the Coptic Church um, were also. Uh, passing away. So in that decade, um, the church lost people like Pope Shenouda and Father Matthew the Poor. Um, and this also comes with a great political shift in Egypt through um, the two successive uh, revolutions. Uh, Fanous trained a number of students who are active as iconographers today in both Egypt and in the diaspora, um, and who include a handful of great masters. And with this shift today, the Coptic Church is experiencing a dramatic ressourcement, mainly in patristics, liturgics, pastoral studies, and Coptic studies. The freedom to build new churches being granted under CC's regime is also causing an unprecedented increase in church projects, which all need iconographers. However, in the face of this growth in theology and economic prosperity, iconography remains mostly excluded from the conversation and is frequently seen with suspicion by some theologians as being currently nothing more than a business. Often iconographers are provided with ample funding without much theological direction. The result can sometimes be described as form, if you're lucky, without content. The majority of churches are still painted in a sentimentalizing imitation of Baroque painting, and the few supporters of Coptic iconography are often fixated on the importance residing within the style, per se, of the work. Professor Schneider often said that it was programming that makes a church orthodox. The result is often churches painted with the correct style, proportion, color symbolism, and all the rest of it, with little harmony or theology, leading to a further rejection of traditional iconography from the other side. And you can see how this becomes a self-perpetuating cycle. And we are left with another question that Professor Schneider often asked, which is, who is the programmer? Who is the programmer of a church in a situation like this? Does the theology of icons rest in the purview of the priest or the patron, or is it the iconographer themselves? Now, the situation with Fanus is um, analogous in some ways to what happens in Greece with um, Photios Contoglou. Um, the problem basically resides in the inability to see tradition as a whole and as having uh, no room for creativity. So on one side, you have people viewing Fanus's work as representing the entirety of Coptic tradition and therefore just producing copies of Fanus or making the same mistake, but falling on the other side, viewing Fanus's work as representing the whole of Coptic tradition and rejecting it altogether in favor of these Baroque imitations. Um, and it doesn't help that culture in general today is influenced by um, attention-grabbing visual language um, from uh, social media. And in Egypt, 
um, a heavy regime of uh, political propaganda, which turns either art form uh, into a loud caricature of itself, whether traditional iconography or classical painting. So we are in need of a theological hermeneutic for art history, um, which allows us to be creative properly. So there's a few points um, that uh, can help in this. Um, and this is all gleaned from um, everything that I had the chance to learn in Professor Schneider's class. We need to have an ecumenical outlook on history. Uh, iconographers must be actively engaging with new archeological discoveries. Much of recently discovered masterpieces of Coptic art were undiscovered or unrestored when Fanus passed away. These are continually expanding our understanding of Coptic tradition. And a masterpiece like this, for example, of the 13th century, the monastery of St. Anthony was uh, completely unrestored when Fanus was formulating his visual language. Um, this magnificent dome um, was only visible as white plaster. And the same thing for this semi-dome in the same church of uh, the Virgin and Thrones. And the Red Monastery, now considered the, one of the greatest masterpieces of Coptic art, was also unrestored at the time. So all of these new discoveries allow us to integrate new things into our understanding of tradition. But it also helps, and this is where the ecumenical outlook really comes in, to view Coptic iconography not as purely Egyptian, and this is where there might be some criticism of Fanus's uh, stated intentions, um, but to uh, see the commonalities between uh, Coptic art and uh, other forms of art happening at the same time. Viewing the, icon the iconography in the context of liturgical theology, understanding things in terms of image and text, how can Henry Maguire's ideas about image and text be transferred and applied to the Coptic context? Um, we have to ask ourselves, what texts are Copts most familiar with today? Um, liturgy, midnight praises, um, the readings especially of Holy Week. And then if we do all of that, we can apply things, um, we can integrate different influences without it being uh, pastiche. Um, so here, for example, Russian tradition views the hospitality of Abraham as uh, an image of the Holy uh, Trinity, whereas such references are nowhere to be found in Coptic liturgical texts. Um, repurposing symbolism, Fanus taught that green was could be used as a symbol of evil, for example, whereas in Canada, um, we see things in a completely different lens. Can images from the past be brought back in and repurposed to address modern uh, questions? And finally, programming, as Professor Schneider taught, is what makes uh, a church orthodox. Um, the idea of programming is pretty much absent from Uspensky and by extension, Fanus. And um, to abstraction must be added that powerful theological uh, programming, wondering again, who is the programmer? And here, uh, I'm gonna conclude uh, by talking about creativity. And I'll just read a quote from Fanus, um, where he talks about creativity. He says, we call on all students to walk in the way of creativity and not in the way of the viewer or the copyist. This represents a lack of creative will, meaning that you repeat, sorry, my apologies. This represents a, a lack of creative will, meaning that you repeat the old and the old is destined to decay, rot and die. However, creativity renews itself. And that is the case with us. We believe in a creative God who freed us from all bonds that we might turn with all our thought and mind to the important things within the universe. And these are just some principles gleaned from um, the iconology of Professor Schneider. And uh, hopefully by applying these principles, we might be able as Copts and indeed as Christians to rise to the challenge of preaching the gospel today. Thank you.
We now turn from iconology to historiography, and I would like to invite the Reverend Dr. Harrison Rusin to talk to us. He's a assistant professor of liturgical music at St. Vladimir's Orthodox Theological Seminary. Thank you, Father Jeffrey, and thank you, Masha. Thank you to everyone for organizing this and for allowing this space for us to get together and uh, remember Richard in all the various ways that he impacted our lives. Uh, I have two words of greeting to start with. One is from the Dean of St. Vladimir Seminary. For those who don't know, most of you probably know, uh, Richard would come to St. Vladimir's every spring for, I, I think, almost 20 years. Uh, he would come for the entire spring semester and often in the fall semester for a week or, uh, or you know, at least a few days. Uh, and he would um, come and teach at least two, sometimes three, sometimes four courses, advise theses. Um, it was a, I, I describe it as a, it was a full contact sport for him. Uh, and it seemed to leave him kind of battered and winded by the end of that spring semester. Uh, but uh, it was um, such a labor of love for him. And we thank you, uh, his, his family in Toronto for sharing him with us in New York. Uh, so this is a reading from uh, Dr. Tudor, Alex Tudoria, who's the Dean of St. Vladimir's. Um, he offers his deep personal respect and condolences to all of Richard's family. And he also offers the respect of St. Vladimir Seminary for Richard's tireless contributions to the seminary as a teacher, a researcher, and a deeply loved member of the community. And then I have a, a slightly longer reflection from Roberta Irvine, who is a professor at St. Nurses Seminary. St. Nurses is an Armenian apostolic seminary uh, close to St. Vladimir's, it's about 30 minutes away, and their students uh, usually take courses at, at St. Vladimir's, so Richard had a very close relationship with St. Nurses as well. So she wrote, thank you for the opportunity to participate on behalf of St. Nurses in Professor Schneider's tribute. These very short comments were unexpectedly difficult to write, how, after all, does one encapsulate the kernel of what such a person has contributed to the life of the world? I'm happy to put them in a different format, but here they are. No one who knew him needs to be told that Richard Schneider was a rare human. It's very true. But for us, the faculty, staff, and students of St. Nurses Armenian Seminary, he was a special kind of phenomenon. He was at home in the world of Armenian theological expression, just as he was in the Byzantine world and in others beyond. We heard so much about that this morning. No matter which world he was speaking into, Richard opened doors to further, deeper understanding for the people who were native inhabitants of that world. He brought people to a wider and more spacious spiritual stance through his own openly enthusiastic insight. Unlike others who are brilliant in their own tradition and thus become eloquent spokesmen and apologists for it, Richard's genius lay in his willingness to become an eloquent spokesman for the thoughts of others. He treated all traditions as if they were his own. And his respect for all the awesome productions of the, of the human soul was extraordinary. St. Nurse's Seminary feels privileged to have had the benefit of Richard Schneider's extraordinary teaching and his friendship. May God raise up for the church others like him in generosity of spirit and depth of understanding. Uh, so this, this paper that I'm presenting uh, came out of a seminar paper that I wrote for Richard's class on historiography when I was a student at St. Vladimir's uh, over 10 years ago. And uh, Richard was also my thesis advisor, uh, which was an extremely demanding task for me and probably for him as well. Uh, and I am now in the situation as a professor at St. Vladimir's of advising theses. And my wife has, who was, my wife also did her thesis with Richard. Um, and he, my wife has repeatedly told me, you can't advise these theses like Richard did. <laughs> yeah. And like I said, he, he would spend at least an afternoon every week with his, with his thesis advisees, just working, 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 uh, meeting, uh, a lot of coffee and um she my wife said you know you you can't do that uh there, there's there's not enough of you to go around but i, I try um 
uh, so this paper, uh, I, I would call Richard every year on his birthday, um, which is in April, it's always around Pascha, and he would always ask if I had published this paper yet. So I'm presenting this because this is actually the last conversation I had, I had with him before he passed away was him asking me what I had done with this paper. I also have to apologize, I'll probably have to leave early uh, to catch a flight. So uh, healing the serpent's bite, canon law and orthodox historiography. Since the development of modern historiography, scholars, historians, and theologians have struggled with articulating a view of church history simultaneously faithful to both theology and the principles of historiography. On the one hand, theology is seen as privileging the study of church history. On the other hand, many writers in the post-Enlightenment age, especially since Gibbon, have endeavored to strip church history of this privilege. God is excised from causality by means of historiographic Occam's razor, Right belief in God becomes a power play, a story of the winners triumphing over the losers. Is there an alternative which can resolve this distinction? If such an alternative exists, at least within Orthodox Christian historiography, it lies in the field of iconology. But by and large, the Orthodox have failed to develop a notion of historiography that takes into account history as iconology. The texts of canon law offer a unique testing ground for the problematic interchange of historiography and church history. Like scriptural texts, they are literary products of a definite time and culture. Like theological texts, they strive for precision of language, often in the face of intense argument and countermands. Like liturgical texts and guides, they are still invoked and used in the life of the Orthodox Church today. Yet, unlike those three categories of scripture, theology, and liturgy, the texts of the canonical corpus present themselves as comprehensive and direct. They prescribe an order for action within ecclesial life. For example, Canon 3 of Laodicea states, he who has been recently baptized ought not to be promoted to the sacerdotal order. The clear and direct language is typical of canonical literature, condition, result. The questions such a canon raises in relation to history are manifold. We saw this, some of this with Evan's paper. How recent is recently baptized? Was there a problem with the new baptisms assuming clerical orders? How does this canon fit into the larger scheme of the canons of Laodicea? Furthermore, how has this canon been interpreted? in the imperial Christian world, in the post-Byzantine world, and in the contemporary age. Such questions regarding orthodox canon law broach similar problems to the two positions outlined above in response to history and church. One can take a fideist or a legalist approach to the canons, seeing them as the clear intention of God acting through bishops and assemblies in order to promote order in the church. From a modern legal perspective, this view is similar to that of constitutional originalism, at least in the United States, which seeks to derive the, uh, this is a quote, frozen non-contingent meaning of the constitution and other legal texts. I'm sure Richard would be uh, cringing at that statement. On the other hand, a different school of interpreters of canon law approach the field from a non-juridical theological background. John Erickson labels this group as anarchist for whom quote, canon law is something to be gotten around an arbitrary system of rules and regulations at best irrelevant to the pastoral task and even to Christianity itself, but more often positively detrimental, end quote. It is important to note, however, that both views of canon law, the legalist and the anarchist, assume that the church through its history is changeless. Nearly all the interpretations of canons assume that in one way or another, the church is an identical institution to that which it was in its primitive form. The question, however, is whether or not the canons are mutable as the church is mutable. This is essentially the same as the question of historicism in church history. What is the nature of historical change in church's history. David Wagshaw, who is an expert on this, notes that the polarization of legal interpretation arises from, this is a quote, a struggle in more modern orthodox legal thought to find a language or set of formulas to take account of a legal tradition that simply does not fit into the categories of modern legal culture, end quote. And he finds the solution in modern legal anthropological and legal theory which have long opened new horizons for the appreciation and theorization of many of the strange dynamics present in Orthodox legal texts." End quote. Wagshaw's study, therefore, is essential for the field of canon law. An examination of how the canons present themselves is necessary in order to understand the field of canon law and open up space for creativity between the two stagnant fields of interpretation explored above. We can expand this horizon of canon even further, however, by taking into account the iconological nature of church history and canon law. David Wagshaw comes closest to incorporating iconology into a canonical, canonical outlook. 
he concludes that, quote, the Byzantine canonical tradition does consciously conceive of itself as a collection of rules which possess their own name, end quote. Canon law and his appraisal is not a system written for professional rule expert, proficient rule experts, proficient at operating proprietary legal techniques and definitions, but a professional culture expert, an educated amateur who is able to negotiate correctly among the mass of cultural narratives, along with the canons, relevant to any particular issue. I will push Wagshaw's observations even further, however. Do these texts operate in a primarily iconological fashion? I intend to examine the field of canon law with respect to one particular prob problematique. The tension between two traditional interpretations of historical texts arises from the lack of an iconological understanding of the texts and their production. In the original version of this paper, which I've edited down, I will examine two separate canonical issues, each with their own meta problems and specifically instantiated problems. The first canonical question I considered uh, is that of conflicting canons. The second canonical question I consider is that of economia, or translated often as economy, but it has many different translations. Of course, in deference to the schedule, uh, I will only discuss the second of these questions, the nature of economia in canon law. To briefly present the first question, though, I will merely observe that there are canons within the canonical corpus that contradict each other. These contradictions, among other perceived flaws, have led some commentators to call for a revision or codification of canon law, similar to the revision of canon law in the Roman Catholic Church in the 19th and 20th centuries. But this codification bears its own epistemological problems. Unless understood hermeneutically, it presents itself and is presupposed by its users as universally normative. The Byzantine mindset behind the formulation of canon law is different from the mindset that adheres to codification. This late antique worldview eschews nearly every crystallized notion we have of modern law. For example, Basil of Caesarea in his third canon from uh, one of his epistles, Epistle 188, provides the measure of discipline for a deacon who has committed fornication, claiming to be following the ancients, ton exarchis. Basil writes that only one punishment is necessary for this deacon, deposition, deposed or defrocked, we could say, not deposition and excommunication, but he provides a further reason. In a general, in general, a true remedy is, with, is withdrawal from sin. Thus, he who for pleasure of the flesh has rejected grace, but by chastisement of the flesh and by complete subjection of it through co continency has abandoned the pleasures whereby he was mastered, will furnish for us a complete proof of his cure. We should therefore know both what is according to the strict rule and what is according to the custom. And in matters which do not admit of the strictest interpretation, we should follow the decision handed down. For Basil and the Byzantine fathers in general, the truer remedy guides their canonical vocabulary. Thus, the canon exists in order to apply either the strict rule or the custom. Basil's comments on the true remedy leads directly to a discussion on sacramental economy, economia, a problem which highlights the iconological, un, iconological nature of canon law and orthodox historiography. Many writers see the issue of economy as tantamount to dispensation, a technical term in the Roman Catholic canonical tradition. But this restricted, restricted technical approach to the question of economia misses the point of canon law in general. John Meindorf remarks that the concept of economy is sometimes given the narrow sense of dispensation and thus opposed to exactness or acrivia. This use of the term is correct in some instances, while economy, the concern for man's salvation, requires actions contrary to the letter of the law. But there are also cases when economy, that is, concern for man's salvation, requires absolute strictness even beyond the letter. John Erickson is even more exacting in his appraisal of the misuse of the term economia, while he notes that economia is understood as the departure from or suspension of strict application acrivia, of the church's canons and disciplinary norms, making it many respects analogous to the West's dispensation. He attempts to recover the meaning of economia within the Byzantine canonical uh, use, aside from its use in justifying a Cyprianic view of the church. Economy itself, as I noted earlier, is an iconological question and is deeply explored in Basil's first canon on the question of rebaptism. Basil writes that it is proper to reject the baptism of the Novationists because they practice, quote, a peculiar baptism of their own whereby they have violated even their own practice. But he proceeds with a modification of his canon, quote, if, however, this shall pr prove injurious to the general discipline, the Catholic economia, 
we must resort again to custom and must follow the fathers who have dispensed legislation, who have economized, that pertains to us. The canon, in other words, end quote, the canon, in other words, is held in tension with the custom, which directs that the rule of the canon always leads towards salvation in Christ. So we can see here that the application of canon law is iconological, not juridical. The application of a canon is concerned not with the rule, but with the salvation of the lost and the repentance of the sinner, not with a general disp uh, disciplinary feature of law as inherited from the Roman legal tradition. Perhaps the most famous canon integrating this view is the 102nd canon of the Council in Trullo. We saw with Evan's paper, the 101st canon. So this is the one after that. It's also the final canon of Trullo, uh, also called the Quinisex Council. This canon even appeals to that precedent from Basil's third canon on the tension of custom and rule. Oh, this is a long canon, I'll only read parts of it. It behooves those who have received from God the power to loose and bind, as in priests and bishops, to consider the quality of the sin and readiness of the sinner for conversion, and to apply medicine suitable for the disease, lest if he is injudicious in each of these respects, he should fail in regard to the healing of the sick man. For the whole account is between God and him to whom the pastoral rule has been delivered, to lead back the wandering sheep and to heal the serpent's bite, and that he may neither cast them down to the precipices of despair, nor loosen the bridle towards dissolution or contempt of life, but in some way or other, either by means of sternness and astringency or by greater softness and mild medicines, to resist the sickness and exert himself for the healing of the ulcer, now examining the fruits of his repentance and wisely managing the man who is called to higher illumination. I'll abridge it there. The iconological bearing of the term economia is wide and deserves its own study. John Erickson points out that the fundamental meaning of economia is management, arrangement, determination in a strictly neutral sense. The basic sense then is something that is given or entrusted to another, as in a steward, uh, in order to keep it for the salvation of those at hand. This in the biblical sense, this is the biblical sense of economia, as when Paul states that God has made known to us in all wisdom and insight the mystery of his will as a plan, is economion, for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, Ephesians chapter one. Economy in the biblical and Basilian sense, as in from St. Basil, has nothing to do with legal order and dispensation, as I said earlier. It is a question of salvation, a question of the tasks that need to be affected and accomplished in order to lead the subject at hand to salvation. The case of canon law thus stands as a paradox. A canon is not legal in a juridical sense, but only in the sense of the law of Christ to bear one another's burdens, Galatians chapter 6. This iconological approach to canon law is the same approach that would be useful in examining Christian historiography. Rowan Williams paints the picture most plainly. For the Christian, he says, for the Christian studying history, he or she is not merely studying the past. She is not studying what appears to be records of investiture, betrayal, doctrinal controversy, and scriptural interpretation. Rather, he or she is studying the present. To quote Williams, uh, we can see that our immersion in the ways in which they responded becomes part of the way we actually hear the call ourselves in more and more diverse and more and more complete ways. Williams articulates an iconological approach to history, an approach which corresponds to the iconology of canon law, separating a modern historical discipline from the economic and iconological pursuit of salvation. Iconology is not only the study of texts, but the study of texts that respond to their readers. Iconology is furthermore the recognition that all creation, including history and canon law, is a text that has been written in order to affect salvation. The problem of church history and historiography remains one of the central epistemological problems of Christian faith. The tension between a historical faith, this Jesus who was a historical person, and the unknowability of history, and the tension between historical factors of causation and appeal to religious notions of causation. Iconology, both within canonical interpretation and history, history in general, begins to move disciplines beyond narrow limits into the domain of interpretation. As I showed above, the approach of Basil of Caesarea to canonical interpretation was counter to our modern sense of law and legal interpretation. While modern interpreters may seek to establish the historical context behind any legal pronouncement, thus, for example, moving toward codification, for Basil, that context 
is a valid category only insofar as it affects salvation. Indeed, we see a similar understanding of canon law and of history when reading the Cappadocian Fathers. They present an understanding which similarly encompasses the wider iconological purpose of history. History happened only insofar as it involves our salvation. This is very clear in uh, Basil's Hexameron. Likewise, canons are legal only insofar as they lead to salvation. Thank you. Thank you for what is a very timely talk. Anybody who knows the Orthodox world today. Uh, next, we have the Reverend Father Bogdan Vladio, who is a PhD student at Trinity College, to continue our historiographical theme. Thank you. This is um, adapted from a chapter of my MTS thesis that uh, Richard directed. Um, as to my predecessor, I don't know, I found the process exhilarating. It wasn't, you know, it was just exhilarating. And um, it's called The Concept of Frontier and the Development of the Orthodox Church in North America. Uh, it engages with Frederick Turner's frontier thesis, which I, to this day, would not have heard of if it wasn't for Richard. At the present time, there are 14 canonically recognized Eastern Orthodox jurisdictions in North America. With one exception, all of them are canonically dependent upon patriarchates or national churches whose centers are in Europe or the Middle East. The exception is the Orthodox Church in America, commonly known as the OCA. The OCA traces its origin to a group of monks who came to Russian Alaska in 1794. The Russian Orthodox Church set up a diocesan structure there, which, following the USA's purchase of Alaska, was moved to San Francisco in 1872, and then to New York in 1905. Following the Bolshevik Revolution in 1918, this Russian diocese, formerly known as the Russian Orthodox Greek Catholic Church in America, and colloquially known as the Metropolia, was functionally orphaned and claimed an independent status vis-a-vis -vis the Russian Orthodox Church in the Soviet Union. Over the course of decades, the Metropolia took on a greater and greater American identity, culminating in its asking and receiving autocephaly, church independence, from the Moscow Patriarchate in 1970. All the other Orthodox jurisdictions and dioceses in North America were officially constituted in the 20th century, either as a result of immigration due to economic factors or due to refugees fleeing war and repressive regi regimes. Immigrants, after establishing themselves in the New World, would write to their home churches requesting that clergy be sent to meet their spiritual needs. As a result, these churches came under and continue to remain within the hierarchical jurisdiction of overseas synods. In this paper, I argue that the experience of the American frontier played a crucial role in the formation of the mindset or fronima of the Orthodox Church in America, which greatly contributed to its ability to conceptualize itself as an Eastern Orthodox Church body, which need not be dependent upon a foreign patriarchate. The Russian mission was in some sense always caught between two worlds. In Alaska, these were the worlds of Russian and native Alaskan culture. In the lower 48, the divide was between the Russian Orthodox cultural and religious tradition over and against the predominant American culture. Internal frontiers also appeared between the parishioners of small multicultural diocesan parishes and the numerically greater Carpatho-Russian and Galician immigrant communities who had converted from Unitism between the members of the Russian diocese in the Greek, Middle Eastern, and Balkan dioceses, which, beginning in the 1920s, were founded on American soil, and eventually between the convert and the cradle Orthodox. The idea of frontier is a useful conceptual tool in analyzing these two world divides in terms of competing mentalities, which eventually led to the expectation and demand for autocephaly in the metropolia. The frontier thesis proposed by Frederick Turner, which identified a subtle yet undeniable role in the formation of the American mindset, plays a similar role in identifying the psychological development of the mission diocese. For the latter, though, its influence was doubled, since Siberia, then Alaska, was the frontier of the Russian Empire, and this eastward frontier movement through Russia finally encountered the westward frontier movement in the United States. <clears throat> 
Mark Stoko fittingly refers to the Aleutian Islands and Alaskan coast as Russia's Wild East, much like the American Wild West. When in 1870, an Episcopal see was founded on United States territory, and especially after the transfer of the sea to San Francisco in 1872, the American frontier mentality melded with its Russian counterpart. Both the American and Russian pioneers had the opportunity to establish new beginnings in an undeveloped space in the context of independence, reinforced by freedom and the absence of European cultural constraints and mores. This sense of freedom and possibility became a part of the ambient culture of the Russian diocese. Turner notes that the American frontier is sharply distinguished from the European frontier. And by the European frontier, he, he describes it as a fortified boundary line running through dense populations. He goes on to say that the most significant thing about the American frontier is that it lies at the hither, end, a hither edge of free land. Cyril Hovorun expresses the same idea from an ecclesiolo ecclesiological perspective. Quote, the rationale of a frontier is not to protect the territory inside, but to expand and to cover as much uncultivated land as possible. This metaphor relates to the dynamism of mission, which constitutes an intrinsic feature of the nature of the church, close quote. The juxtaposition of Hovorun's and Turner's observations in regard to frontier offer an insight into the develop developing self-consciousness of the mission diocese and metropolia. Turner obs observes that, quote, in the settlement of America, we have to observe how European life entered the continent and how, American, how America modified and developed that life and reacted on Europe. Our early history is the history of European germs developing in an American environment. The advance of the frontier has meant a steady movement away from the influence of Europe, a steady growth of independence on American lines. And to study this advance, the men who grew up under these conditions and the political, economic, and social results of it is to study the really American part of our history. First, we note that the frontier promoted the formation of a composite nationality for the American people. But the most important effect of the frontier has been in the promotion of democracy here and in Europe, close quote. The American transformation of European life, the waning influence of Europe, composite nationality and democracy all became formative elements in the development of the unique personality of the mission diocese. While also acknowledging the democratizing influence of the frontier, Francis Sviripa, reflecting upon the immigrant experience in Western Canada, notes the impossibility of the Anglican Church to, quote, automatically assume preeminence by right or tradition on the prairies and its need to readjust accordingly, close quote. The Russian Orthodox Church, like the Anglican, occupied a privileged position in its home country, and the social, cultural, and psychological adjustments it faced in the New World were much greater than those faced by the Anglicans in Western Canada. Povorun argues that a frontier mentality is necessary for any church which wishes to be in a proper relationship to the world. He contends that, quote, an internally stratified church with developed administrative structures has a tendency to be centripetal and autarkic. It often considers itself in parallel to, rather than in the world, where it is called to go and preach. The mentality of sharp cut borderlines extrapolates itself from within the church to its borderlines that separate it from the world. An alternative to the mentality of sharp cut borderlines is the open mentality of frontiers. Frontiers are a key image to understanding what the church is in its nature and how it is related to the world." Close quote. Hovorun's conception of the ecclesial frontier mentality clearly reflects the driving force behind the Russian Orthodox missionaries' activity in Alaska. But after the diocese moved to the continental United States, and especially in the late 19th and early 20th centuries after it received an influx of Carpatho-Russian as well as other Slavic and non-Slavic immigrants into its fold, the American frontier, which served to take disparate peoples and unite them into a single ethnos, came squarely up against an ethnic wall of faithful and parishes who identified themselves primarily in terms of nationality and only secondarily in terms of faith. 
This ethnic wall was characteristic of Turner's description of a European frontier, quote, a fortified boundary line running through dense populations. This was one of the factors which caused Tikhon, the Archbishop of the Russian Diocese in North America between 1898 and 1907, to attempt to resolve the problem of the ethnic frontier by organizing parishes and dioceses on the basis of nationality rather than geography. Dmitry Grigoryev paints a bleak picture of the state of affairs within the Russian diocese in the first two decades of the 20th century. And his analysis of the problem involves points of conflict between the American and European mentalities, as well as the way immigrants were adapting and being integrated into American society and culture, specifically in reference to the ideas of freedom and democracy. He writes, quote, in order to understand all these complexities which arose at that time, one must realize several important facts about the Orthodox people of this country. One, the impact of the American way of life and of the American conception of democracy on the Orthodox or former Union immigrants who came here from non-democratic environments. Two, their generally low intellectual and educational level. Three, the very inadequate education of the priests. Four, the complete religious freedom in America loyalty to churches based on free will only. Five, the presence of some political refugees among the Orthodox immigrants associated with the leftist movement in Russia. And six, old national sympathies, prejudices, and hatreds brought here from the old countries. Well, unquote. While parishioners engaged with American culture, the clergy tended to remain isolated, neither wishing to learn English nor to integrate into society. Quote, the rigidly conservative makeup of the Russian clergy was caused by their specific upbringing and education. This made it difficult for them to integrate themselves into a foreign milieu. Many Russian priests upon their arrival in a foreign country, instead of learning the language, culture, and customs of the people of that country, would hide in the ghettos of their parishes and would shut the door to the outside world." Close quote. This lived dichotomy between the lives of the parishioners and the lives of the clergy often resulted in conflict, whether over philosophical or political ideologies such as socialism, or because the clergy were critical of, quote unquote, disobedient members of their flock. Progressive political and religious views combined in the nascent renovationist movement, which became a competitor for the parishes and faithful of the metropolia in the 1920s. American democratic values may well have formed the idea in the minds of the Orthodox parishioners that they should possess a voice in the governance of church, much like they did in American political life, which in turn may well have contributed to the formation of Bishop Tikhon's conciliar vision for church governance. With time, the processes of acculturation and assimilation continued the work of the American frontier as elucidated by Turner, so that in 1976, Father Thomas Hopko could write, quote, Members of the Orthodox churches, both lay people and clergy, have accepted the fundamental religious structure of American society, but also that they have accepted a way of understanding, experiencing, and living their church membership, which is determined by the doctrines and practices of the American way of life, and not by the traditional doctrines and practices of their own church. Close quote. In its adulthood, the Metropolia, or OCA, clearly embraced a non-centripetal and autarkic approach to its mission on an official level, and responded critically to those churches or jurisdictions which were more or exclusively concerned with caring for their own people while eschewing unity as a function of mission and witness. But the ethnic principle did not die, whether it be Russian, Romanian, Albanian, Bulgarian, or American. Those who sought Orthodox unity were up against this ethnic principle, which did not diminish even when missionary outreach did little by little begin to succeed in attracting American converts to Orthodoxy. The tension between the European and American frontiers is no less real today than it was in 1964, when Father Alexander Schmemann wrote that, quote, the situation in America is radically different from the whole historical experience of Orthodoxy. Not only the Orthodox Church was brought here by representatives of various Orthodox nations, but it was brought as precisely the continuation of their national existence. Hence, the problem of canonical or ecclesiological unity, which, as we have seen, is a self-evident requirement of the very truth of the Church, encounters here difficulties that cannot be simply reduced to the solutions of the past." Unquote. The autocephaly of the Orthodox Church in America resulted from a confluence of many factors, 
the Bolshevik Revolution with the subsequent persecution of the Moscow Patriarchate by the Soviet authorities, the suspicion and mistrust which characterized North American attitudes towards the Soviet Union during the Cold War, theological reflection upon the principles of Eastern Orthodox ecclesiology, and the leadership of eminent theologians such as Fathers Alexander Schmemann and John Meyendorf. The formative contribution of the Russian mission's experience of three frontiers, the wild east of the Russian Empire, the wild west of the USA and Canada, and the ethnic frontier separating the given Orthodox dioceses in North America was undoubtedly a major contributing factor to the development of the mindset of the faithful and leaders of the OCA as well. Thank you. One last push. <laughs> it's a day that takes, I think, a lot out of us for many different reasons, but uh, three more papers to go, which I'm looking forward to, to hearing. So please join me in welcoming Mark Jani, who is going to talk to us about the history of the Coptic Orthodox liturgy as a hermeneutics of liturgical theology. Hello, everyone. Christ is risen. My presentation is going to be a part of my MTS thesis about Coptic liturgical reform, um, which is I'm currently working uh, on. Um, but before asking the question of liturgical reform and before properly locating the question of its methodology, one should ask the question of the historical methodology, and particularly reading the history of the Coptic liturgy, which is um, my scope of study. The openings of the notion of liturgical reform in the reading of history, sometimes they overvaluate the historical view, falling into the snare of historicism. Instead of making the past an object of contemplation, it becomes a share of the life past. The snare of historicism instead of history leads to the snare of zealot and radical traditionalism in lieu of the living tradition. On the other end of the spectrum, Professor Richard Schneider presents a hermeneutical approach as an alternative historical methodology. So my presentation today is going to be about the history of the Coptic Orthodox liturgy as hermeneutics of liturgical theology. For Professor Schneider, history is a hermeneutical attitude that weighs more heavily than merely the systematic study and documentation of the human past. History is not merely about absolute facts. That's the high, way, the, 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 the high school way of reading history, as he once said. But it is a great deal more than that. History, or rather historical methodology, is analytical par excellence. The task of historians is to interpret the past into what can be understood by today's postmodern person. Professor Schneider applies that methodology to the study of church history. For him, church history is the hermeneutics of ecclesiology, where history is not simply the construction of a record of past ecclesial events, but about the, the, the theoretical and methodological framework for how they are interpreted. He asserts that through the hermeneutic of Christian understanding, what should, what, what should, one should understand the history of the church using the tools of the practicing historian. An infinite, an infinite number of possible conclusions and significant topics can be drawn by applying this methodology. Moreover, applying history as a discipline, Professor Schneider sees the call of the church to be a church in biblical terms to put on Christ is not divorced from the church's self-critique. That is to say, church history becoming church and the church reform, or better, reform, are highly intertwined. For Professor Schneider, the interpretation is considered to be an act that transcends the limit of previous, the limits previously drawn in the text, which he believes could not have been crossed without an understanding of the hermeneutical interpretive practice. According to Professor Schneider, one of the meanings of the church is to put on Christ. It is axiomatic that to put on Christ lies at the heart of the main act of the church, which is the liturgy. Admittedly, the, 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 the theological renewal is rooted in the rediscovery of the centrality of the Eucharist. Alexander Schmemann confirms that by and in the Eucharist, which is the act that makes the church what she is, both theology and the church are united again. Furthermore, Professor Schneider affirms that this historical methodology is what makes it a core subject in any program of theological studies. Through a liturgical lens, this triadic historical methodology of hermeneutics, of ecclesiology, which is church, history, and hermeneutics, 
creates consequently a new triad of hermeneutics of liturgical theology, which is liturgy, history, and hermeneutics. Therefore, I would argue that this hermeneutical attitude can be applied to other types of history, such as the history of the liturgy, and particularly the history of the Coptic Orthodox liturgy. Within a Coptic Orthodox context and through the lens of Professor Schneider's historical methodology, the history of the Coptic Orthodox liturgy should also be read in a theological hermeneutic, such as narratives that can be built, argued, and presented in a particular theological framework. Throughout history, liturgical reform and the history of, of, the, history of the liturgy have always persisted in a particular hermeneutic framework that perceives reality and does liturgy in a way to, per to persist in this hermeneutic. In that sense, the history of the Coptic Orthodox liturgy can be seen as hermeneutics of liturgical theology. Looking closer to the relationship between liturgy and, and history, on the one hand, prior to Schmemann's influence, liturgy tended to be nothing more than an object of study for history first and theology second. On the other hand, Schmemann perceives liturg liturgy to be the source. Admittedly, Schmemann himself is more drawn to church history and he relies heavily on, his, uh, on history in his liturgical theology. Through a theological lens, the, the results gained by historians must then become an object of theological study. Putting Professor Schneider in dialogue with David Fagerberg, Fagerberg distinguishes between the history of liturgy and liturgical history. On the one hand, the study of history is the study of change. The study of the history of the liturgy is the study of, of, of the study of the development and change of the liturgy. On the other hand, in layman terms, Fagerberg argues that to speak about liturgical his, history, one should not begin just with Abraham and his offering to Isaac, leading to Moses, then to the Israel's kings and prophets preparing for Christ, the great high liturgist, but rather begin with Adam and Eve. And the long story of salvation history was designed to restore men and women to their liturgical state by becoming apprentices to Christ. Figerberg's opinion is likely plausible since Christ is God incarnate in history. Therefore, history itself becomes a reflection of the liturgical reality. As Thomas Telly puts it, Christ is now transhistorical. For Fagerberg, liturgical, hi liturgical history is more than the history of liturgy. The way the church is more than the Jesus club. An icon is more than a picture. A symbol is more than a sign. A sacrament is more than a souvenir. Professor Schneider's historical methodology is not, is not to look at history, but to look through history to see the meaning of the church. This conclusion is echoed by Figerberg in, this book on, on, uh, in his book on liturgical asceticism, declaring liturgical theology is not looking at the liturgy, it is looking through the liturgy to see the world in its course of transfiguration, end quote. Consequently, liturgical reform, my scope of study, must hermeneutically look through the history of the liturgy, having the lens of liturgical history. In a nutshell, liturgy grounds itself in history, though never reduced to it. And liturgical theology is grounded in both the history of liturgy and liturgical history. In that sense, history is, not, is a hermeneutical attitude, and consequently, the history of the liturgy is a hermeneutics of liturgical theology. On the basis of these introductory remarks, my argument is to look through the history of the Coptic Orthodox liturgy, and particularly through the history of the Coptic liturgical reform and change. Acquiring Professor Schneider's methodology in today's time, Coptic liturgical reform is possible if the history of the Coptic liturgy becomes a hermeneutics of liturgical theology. The history of liturgy, which is the liturgy's past, is fundamental to understanding its present shape, not its future. As brought well by Professor Schneider, open quote, historians are not allowed to predict the future, the theologians are. Theologians predict the future because theology is absolutely grounded in eschatology. I can sum up the future in one word, Christ. He is our future. In our life journey, that is where we are all heading to that future, end quote. In my thesis, I will present a few historical paradigms of Coptic liturgical reform, but now I will very briefly mention two of them, and I will um, shed some light on their her uh, hermeneutical reading. Firstly, liturgical language and pastoral challenges. 
The question of the liturgical language was raised in the 20th century in the Russian Orthodox Church, where the use of Slavonic was widely discussed during the, the preparation for the local council of 1917-1918, as well as the Roman Catholic Church, where the use of Latin was questioned in Sacrosanctum Concilium in Vatican II. Although this question was raised as early as the 12th century in the Coptic Orthodox Church, where Coptic language as its liturgical language faced a particular non-spontaneous liturgical um, reform. One of the liturgical reformers of the Coptic Orthodox Church is Pope Gabriel II, who issued a set of canons, 32 canons. Canon number three allows the Arabization of the Coptic liturgy. He allowed the use of Arabic with the Coptic, since the Coptic language began, began, began to diminish in comparison to the Arabic language. To comprehend the motive beyond Gabriel's reform, one would need to carefully read the rest of the canons in which he urges to instruct the children in the priesthood before teaching them Arabic lessons. In Gabriel's eyes, Arabic is nothing more than an, a system of communication. Here, his main hope is to raise the undercatechized younger generation within the church, and for pastoral reasons, he is clearly concerned about the future of the church since today's child is tomorrow's leader. This may be seen as a reaction to the situation of theological and educational weakness in the church in this period, due to the language barrier. Thus, renewing the catechesis through this liturgical reform is therefore of a paramount pastoral importance. It is a paradigm of liturgical change in the Christian East that it is worthy of study. From a hermeneutical standpoint and following the Schneiderian methodological footsteps, many possible significant topics can be drawn from this liturgical change, pastorally, uh, mainly pastoral subject. This canon has something to say about the interplay between the duties of the pastor and the matters of pastoral care to the liturgical responsibility for the well-being of the souls of his flock. This canon also says something about the extent to which the pastor sacrifices a traditional heritage and whether the liturgical language is a small t tradition or a, or a capital T tradition. I'm trying to read this historical paradigm or this historical uh, paradigm of liturgical uh, uh, reform by looking through the history of liturgy, not just looking at the history of uh, the liturgy. Secondly, the canonization of, Coptic, of the Coptic liturgical texts. The Coptic Orthodox liturgy has undergone quite a significant number of changes, either by omission or by addition, both spontaneous and non-spontaneous evolutions. Um, but the question that raises itself is what is in and what is out and based on what criteria? By way of example, the Coptic Orthodox Church used to have more than 10 Eucharistic liturgies in Upper Egypt. Gabriel II in Canon number 26, he omits the use of the Sahidic liturgies and endorses the use of the three liturgies known in Cairo and Skiris, that is the liturgies of Basil, Gregory and Cyril, instead of the diversity in liturgical traditions. It is an omission for the sake of unification. But why and how? All these questions need to be answered hermeneutically. We have liturgical hymns that are, that are attributed to Saint, Saint John Damascene. In what circumstances these texts were adopted by the church? Do the schisms have anything to do with borrowing or adapting liturgical texts from the Eastern Orthodox Church? I guess not. And finally, the Coptic liturgy is more than texts. What is found in liturgical manuscripts was rooted in a social cultural narrative without which the Coptic liturgy cannot be understood in depth. Professor Schneider once said that, open quote, to get from the primary sources what they are saying is analytic is analytical process. It's not mere discovery. Another way to put that, primary sources never tell you what happened, end quote. That is the role of the hermeneutical methodology. It's all about questions seeking to determine how the liturgy was actually lived in the church as a historical community of actual people and how to understand the living connection between people and the liturgy. Thank you. Continuing in our tradition of current brilliant Copts here at Trinity, we have a PhD student uh, Karim Girgis who will talk to us about the transformative power of a ritual hermeneutic. Hello. Uh, as what Jeffrey said, I am, my name is Karim Gerges. I, I was one of uh, Professor Schneider's students, and I'll uh, be talking about um, more broadly how ritual 
informs us, but more specifically, the necessity in interpreting uh, ritual. Um, within an Orthodox Christian framework, ritual is directed towards human uh, formation. It places man within an enacted narrative, which moves them towards formation into the self-emptying likeness of Christ. However, it is not uncommon for Orthodox Christians to attend various liturgical services and not themselves be formed. Human formation requires um, an immersion into a narrative. However, the interpretation of this nar narrative affects the formation um, of the human being. Liturgical formation, therefore, must work towards nurturing a hermeneutic lens through which man is able to interpret liturgy. This is achieved through mystagogy, which shapes the interpretative uh, lens of man to find Christ as telos to ritual, and thus through enacting the very life of Christ, through encounter with him, man is formed into his very likeness. In more, <clears throat> in more than one way, ritual is aimed at human formation. Human formation has very little indeed to do with intellectual propositions and much to do with narrative. In being entrenched with stories, uh, within stories, man is formed by the patterns therein. As Ellis there McIntyre writes, it is through hearing stories about wicked stepmothers, lost children, good but misguided kings, wolves that suckle twin boys, youngest sons who receive no, no inheritance but must make their own way in, in the world, and eldest sons who waste their inheritance on riotous living and go into exile to live with swine, that children learn or mislearn both what a child and what a parent is, what the cast of characters may be in the drama into which they have been born, and what the ways of the world are. Deprive children of stories, and you leave them unscripted, anxious stutterers in their actions as in their words. It is no coincidence that narrative underlies the whole um, of Orthodox praxis, scripture, liturgy, hagiography, all present the very, narr the, narr excuse me, the very narrative of God's own story through which men ought to be formed. None of these different pieces of Orthodox tradition aimed at being, uh, aimed to begin at the intellect. Vigen Goroyan warns of this as he writes, the great stories avoid didacticism and supply the imagination with important symbolic information about the shape of our, of our world and appropriate responses to its inhabitants. Rather, Orthodoxy, through the various segments of its tradition, moves man within a narrative, thereby forming him into an intimate resemblance of God. Therefore, in the words of Father Jeffrey, uh, claiming that narrative as our own, we reshape and arrange the events of our life to conform to the nomon to Christu, the canonic pattern of Christ. Ritual as such is the choreo choreo choreography of this narrative. There's a famous story in the sayings of the Desert Fathers um, that says it was said of, about John the Dwarf that he withdrew and lived in the desert of Skitis with an old man of Thebes. His Abba, taking a piece of dry wood, planted it and said to him, water it every day with a bottle of water until it bears fruit. Now the water was so far away that he had to leave in the evening and return the following morning. At the end of three years, the wood came to life and bore fruit. Then the old man took some of the fruit and carried it to the church, saying to the brethren, take and eat the fruit of obedience. This story found within the early Christian tradition exposits this early understanding of the formative aspects of ritual. After all, movement is what incarnates this position. In this story, it was obedience that sprouted the tree, one might say, not the ritual of watering a piece of wood. However, this pericope highlights the necessity of ritual in materializing this obedience. To be obedient, ritual was necessary, and the lack of ritual precluded obedience. Despite its formative effects, ritual is fundamentally ambiguous. For example, the story of, about Abba John the Short presents um, the fruitful effects of obedience. However, it can be correctly pointed out that it was not the act of watering a piece of wood that sprouted a tree. Rather, it was his, his obedience. As such, it is imperative that ritual be interpreted through the correct hermeneutic lens. If Abba John had watered the piece of dry wood without being told, or if he was told not to water it and he watered it nonetheless, disobediently, then the tree would not have sprouted. The possibility of formation through ritual was only possible through, through a hermeneutic that interpreted this ritual as obedience, as self-emptying. The same applies to all Orthodox ritual. Excuse me. <laughs> the use of candles, incense, iconography, liturgical vestments, the architecture of the liturgical space, hymnography, liturgical kissing and processions, prostrations, water, and ultimately bread and wine is all formative However, it is only formative when it is in the incarnation of the self-emptying cross of Christ within human life. 
all the material aspects of the orthodox liturgical life are simply signs to their prototype. Augustine um, of Hippo in, this, uh, in his text on Christian teaching writes, so now being about to treat um, of signs, I have this to say, that we are not particularly interested in the fact that they are, but rather that, that they are precisely signs. That, that is, they signify. A sign, after all, is a thing which, besides the impression it conveys to the senses, also has the effect of making something come to mind. Augustine here highlights the, distinct, the distinction of the sign from the thing to which it points. The sign, that is the ritual, must never be confused to be the thing, that is the telos of its own self. It was not the act of watering that brought about the tree. Rather, it was the act of obedience carry, carried out by the ritual of watering. It is not candles, incense, icons, vestments, or any other one piece of ritual that is the end of orthodox liturgical practice. Rather, it is the, in, uh, the enactment of the cross, uh, thereby imitating and encountering Christ that is the end of ritual. As such, it is, it is vital to seek the thing through the sign. That is, one must not cease at the experience of the sign, but must uh, always be moving towards the thing. This is, after all, the very telos of the sign. In the words of Clement of Alexandria, since the forms of the truth are two, the names and the things, we must therefore occupy ourselves not with the expression, but the meaning. However, an incorrect hermeneutic lens makes it impossible to reliably reach this meaning, which Clement speaks of. An example of this is given by Father Alexander Schmemann. The iconostasis, Schmemann points out, is a victim of such misinterpretation. Schmemann laments the misunderstanding, uh, the quote, <laughs> misunderstanding of the iconostasis as primarily a wall that separates the altar from the laity and places an impassable barrier between them. Yet, as strange as it may seem to the majority of Orthodox today, the iconostasis origin originated from a completely opposite purpose, not to separate, but to unite, end quote. This perception of the iconostasis as dividing um, as opposed to uniting completely shifts that very act of the community within the liturgical practice. If Abba John had interpreted the ritual of watering the tree to be disobedience and carried it out with that interpretation, then what happens, in fact, is a complete reversal of the story. This is precisely what happened with, uh, with the example of the iconostasis given by Shmemem. The very disposition of the story carried out by the community shifts from one which unites the nave with the sanctuary, heaven with earth, to one which separates them, thus shifting the very formative effect of ritual. If the very formative effects of ritual hinge on the method of hermeneutics, then this requires that the hermeneutic lens of the Christian be formed in some way. In the story of Abba John discussed above, the hermeneutic lens of the ritual was formed mystagogically. It was in the elder taking the fruit of the tree to the monks and asserting, quote, take and eat of the, uh, the tree, the, excuse me, the fruit of obedience, end quote, that the community was formed to interpret, it, to interpret this ritual of watering to the dry piece of wood as an act of obedience, thus being formed to enact the pattern of obedience. It is the mystagogical um, interpretation of ritual that the hermeneutic of uh, ritual can be formed. However, one uh, thing to note is the retroactive work of mystagogy. It was after the performance of ritual that the ritual was interpreted for the community. This retroactive model closely resembles that of the mystagogical lectures of Cyril of Jerusalem. These were a series of five lectures to newly baptized Christians, interpreting to them, the, uh, in the words of Maxwell Johnson, quote, the rites of Christian initiation they had received and experienced of the Easter vigil only a few days prior, end quote. In Cyril's own words, I have desired for a long time, O truly begotten and much loved uh, much beloved children of the church, to speak to you concerning the spiritual and heavenly mysteries. But since I knew clearly that seeing is more trustworthy than hearing, I waited for this present time in, in order that you being more readily atta attracted to receiving these words about that night, I may lead you to the uh, bright light and fragrant meadow of this present paradise. This pattern even resembles contemporary practice. Today, Infants are baptized, and they're immediately immersed into the liturgical tradition of the church. Very young indeed are children uh, within orthodoxy um, that they become participants in the rituals and liturgical practices of the church. And only as they grow up do they perceive the mystagogical, excuse me, receive the mystagogical education to aid them in interpreting that which they already know through practice. Herein li lies the, the cycle of formation. A Christian is called to be immersed into ritual, after which they are instructed to form a hermeneutic lens. 
through which they can interpret this ritual. And interpreting, in interpreting this ritual, the forthcoming experience of this ritual becomes richer and more complete, thus furthering their formation and therefore also their ability to internalize more of this ritual. In this way, the next uh, time one is receiving mystagogical instruction, they are able to further interpret and appreciate a deeper understanding of the ritual. Accordingly, this creates an unending cycle of experience and, and interpretation through which man is immersed into and formed by the narrative of the liturgical ritual of the church. Um, just to conclude, ritual aims at formation. This, however, provoked an act of interpretation. It is only by reaching the intended telos of the ritual that man can be properly formed thereby. In the words of Cyril of Jerusalem, for although your body might be here, if your mind is not, nothing is gained. As such, the formation of man through ritual, requisite, um, ritual requisites a formation of the hermeneutic lens through which they interpret ritual. Mystagogy that aims at forming this lens of interpretation is a, is a road forward towards the formation of Orthodox Christians through ritual. Adoption of this ancient practice of formation leads to a cycle um, in which man is able to ever grow through liturgical practice. Thank you. We've reached our proverbial last but not least. <laughs> In fact, maybe saved the best for last, have we? My colleague, Dr. Daniel Opperwell, St. Paul as rhetorician, theological implications of John Chrysostom on Romans. Thanks, Father. Uh, this is, thank you for all of you who have stayed. Uh, this has been a, a long day, but I hope very well worthwhile. Certainly for me, uh, it's, it's, it's been amazing to sit with all your memories of uh, Richard and Professor Schneider and um, share them. Uh, it, some of the things that going through my mind as we've all been here are that Richard always made me feel so supported and so loved, and he made me feel like I was the only one in the world, right? And I am a little jealous to learn that that's how he made everyone feel. But it's also such a testament to who he was. And I also wanted to observe that we had a wonderful word coin today, Mark, and that word is Schneiderian. And I hope that it enters the lexicon of, of scholars all over because it's, it really captures something. It captures the lens through which he worked, through, through which he looked at the world, icons especially, but also texts. And we've heard so much about that today, we've heard so much of his voice today. It's really fantastic. Um, so yes, this I've, I've titled The Rhetoric of Salvation, John Chrysostom on Romans 9 through 11. I'm going to just try to present a brief summary here of what will be a longer piece with all my detailed argumentation in, in the book. So to, to some degree, I'm just going to ask you to take my word for it today, and then you can critique all of my texts and all that uh, when we get the book out, and you can go through it that way. So I'll try to keep it short and give you the, the main point. Romans 9 through 11 comes at the pivot point of St. Paul's tripartite letter. Paul has just concluded a discussion in most of chapters 1 through 8 on how his commitment to salvation in Christ impacts his understanding of the Mosaic law. To put it very briefly, for Paul, the law does not save either Gentiles or Jews and makes no one righteous in the eyes of God. Nonetheless, the law remains an essential part of God's plan for human salvation in Paul's eyes. Romans 9 through 11 brings up a related topic. If the Mosaic law is somehow eternally valid and yet not capable of bringing human beings to righteousness, what about the Jews themselves, God's chosen people? St. Paul was and remained a devoted Jew throughout his life, and it is manifest in all his writings that he sees in Christ the fulfillment of his Judaism and by no means believed himself to have converted to something like a new religion, as we moderns might say, when he became a follower of Christ on the road. Nonetheless, Paul's experience of Jesus Christ has made him equally certain that God is now welcoming all people into righteousness and salvation, whether Jew or otherwise, and that Gentiles who become believers in Christ need not be ethnically Jewish, nor follow Jewish legal and religious customs, with some notable exceptions, especially uh, surrounding Jewish sexual morality. But what then does it mean to be a Jew now that faith in Christ is what saves all human beings? That's what Paul will take up here. The details of Paul's approach to this problem in Romans 9 through 11 have been a focus for biblical scholars for generations, and they will doubtless continue to be. Yet many scholarly approaches remain highly unsatisfying. In large part, this is because Romans in particular is often still approached as a systematic treatise on the topics that it addresses. Seeking a clear system and an overarching argument in Paul has been at best difficult, maybe impossible when studying Romans 9 through 11. Paul's text simply does not work the way some of us might want it to. 
Instead, Paul seems to be making several points from a variety of angles, but in my view, that need not cause us very much difficulty. To explicate why that is, it is helpful to roll back the clock, take a look at a much earlier exegete of Paul, the brilliant and the remarkable St. John Chrysostom, one of the greatest devotees of Paul's thought and letters in history. In effect, Chrysostom reads Paul not as a systematic thinker, or even really as a theologian in the proper sense, but primarily as a rhetorician, using every means at his disposal to help his readers and listeners to apprehend deep mystical truth. Chrysostom's reading of 9 through 11, Romans 9 through 11 is important and it's interesting on its own, but it's this connection to rhetoric that has inspired me to present this paper here in honor of Professor Richard Schneider. Like John Chrysostom, Richard was a master of the study of rhetoric, and his apprehension of its significance saturated everything he wrote and taught during his very remarkable career. Framing texts and icons as fundamentally rhetorical works as Richard did helped all of us who knew and learned from him to much better understand how these things really communicate truth and to loosen our expectations about how writers ought to write or painters ought to paint, especially since form and even function may change a great deal across cultures and generations. We are all forever in debt to Richard for his wisdom in these matters and for opening the doors of understanding to so many of us. So back to John Chrysostom. For Chrysostom, Paul's project in Romans 9 through 11 is centered entirely on his love of Christ and his love of his people. This love is the exclusive driving force of what Paul will say, according to Chrysostom. Chrysostom comments as follows, just a very brief one, quote, but since we are so short of love like Paul's, we cannot even form an idea of what is here meant, end quote. For Chrysostom, we quite literally cannot understand what Paul will say in Romans 9 through 11 if we do not first and foremost recognize that his words in these chapters are about love, love for Christ and love for his fellow Jews and love for the Gentiles too. The sharing of this love is Paul's actual purpose here, according to Chrysostom. Love is the target of Paul's rhetoric will aim to hit. As he continues, Chrysostom emphasizes Paul's emotional turmoil in the face of the problems he is discussing. According to Chrysostom, Paul is really and truly being torn apart emotionally by the potential ramifications of the rejection of Christ by some of his fellow Jews. It is for this reason, as Chrysostom quickly observes, that the rhetorician Paul takes great pains to ensure that his readers, especially his Jewish readers, harbor no suspicion that he is speaking out of enmity towards them. If he comes off as harsh, Chrysostom argues, it is only out of his love that he has resorted to polemical tactics. Quote, and here, along with other remarks, he so ordered things as not to seem to be saying what he was going to say out of enmity against them. Hence, he does not decline calling them even kinsmen and brothers. Then he at last goes into the subject most of them were looking for. Now, Paul, Chrysostom will observe that Paul is going to make several arguments, not just one, in order to, to bolster his case, and it will all be a part of the rhetorical plan. Quote, the subject in question was an important one. Hence, he turns to several arguments and endeavors by all means to solve the difficulty, end quote. Should we find ourselves confused by such an approach, Chrysostom notes that creating some perplexity in his readers is itself an intended part of Paul's rhetoric. A good rhetorician, according to Chrysostom, knows just when to create productive confusion in his audience to help them more deeply apprehend the point at hand. It's reminding us of Richard. Quote, you see what difficulty he has filled the subject with, and with great propriety, for when you have power to throw your adversary into perplexity, do not at once bring forward the answer, because if he be found himself responsible for the same ignorance, why take unnecessary dangers upon yourself? End quote. This is a fascinating quotation in that Chrysostom here implies that Paul himself may not have had a clear and complete response to the question of the status of the Jews in light of salvation in Christ. Instead of seeing this as an Achilles heel to everything Paul is saying, Chrysostom instead praises Paul's skill in not giving away too much of his own rhetorical position and instead turning the tables such that his audience recognizes that there are difficulties inherent in their own position too. This is not a problem for Chrysostom because no human being has a complete understanding of God's workings in salvation to begin with. Quote, God only knows who are worthy and no man whatever knows, even if he seemed to know ever so well. And this is why he says, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. That's from Exodus 33. Observe context, for it is not yours to know, O Moses, he means, which are deserving of my love toward man. But leave this to me. But if Moses had no right to know, much less have we, end quote. 
Chrysostom reads Paul as intentionally building a rhetorical space in which his own uncertainty is not a liability, but rather in which his audience is now more likely to be able to welcome the love of Christ that is Paul's genuine hope for them. Quote, this is what an excellent teacher does. He does not follow his disciples' fancy everywhere, but leads them to his own mind and pulls up the thorns and then puts the seed in and does not answer at once in all cases to the questions put to him, end quote. It is in this context that Chrysostom treats the famous lines, Romans 9, 20 through 21, in which Paul talks about God creating some human beings for honor and others for dishonor. Well, these would be used by much later commentators as a kind of scriptural proof for the doctrine of double predestination, among other things. Chrysostom sees no such thing going on in this passage. Instead, the point is once again rhetorical. Paul is merely offering a conditional what-if statement, telling his audience that God is God, and thus, if he even wanted to go so far as to create some people intentionally for dishonor or damnation, then this would be God's right after all. It is not that God has done this. Rather, the rhetorical point is something Paul is making in order to help his readers enter a mental space of humility. Quote from Chrysostom, and this is the only point to which he applied the illustration of the potter and the clay, not, that is, to any enunciation of the rule of life, but to the complete obedience and silence forced upon us. And this we ought to observe in all cases, that we are not to take the illustrations quite entire, but after selecting the good of them and that for which they were introduced, to let the rest alone, end quote. According to Chrysostom, Paul comes to his fullest articulation of his real point about love for, for and faith in Christ in Romans 10. Here, Paul, Paul argues that, quote, quote from Paul here, Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believes, end quote. This, for Chrysostom, is what Romans 9 through 11 is all about. And Paul has placed his chiefest of his assertions precisely here in the middle of these chapters for the purpose of rhetorical order. Chrysostom helps to elucidate his reading of this, Paul's key point, by using a beautiful analogy connecting salvation to the work of healing performed by a physician. Chrysostom puts it this way, quote, Here Paul shows that there is but one righteousness. For if Christ be the end of the law, he that has not Christ even if he seemed to have that righteousness, has it not. But he that has Christ, even though he have not fulfilled the law aright, has received the whole. For the end of the physician's art is health. And then he that can make whole, even though he has not the physician's art, has everything. But he that knows not how to heal, though he seemed to be a follower of the art, comes short of everything. So is it in the case of the law and of faith, end quote. For Chrysostom, Paul wants nothing short of salvation and righteousness for all people. And it is in this motivation to spread the love of Christ that he takes a both-and position to the law and thus to the Jews. Like skilled doctors, the Jews are specially trained and they know much more than others. And yet the value of this special status is only located in achieving the actual end of salvation in Christ for Paul. Chrysostom then emphasizes how from this capstone argument, Paul will work to trot out various kinds of witnesses in favor of his positions throughout Romans 10 through 11 quoting from various scriptures that lend credence to his assertions about God's salvation. Paul is not aiming to prove his point in some systematic sense through pure reasoning. Rather, his goal is to show his audience through rhetoric that there are valid witnesses to his position all over scripture. All of this rhetorical work in Chrysostom's reading helps Paul guide his readers to see the final key points of Romans 9 through 11. First, that a remnant of Israel has indeed been saved. And next, that the Gentiles are, gra are a grafted branch attached to the tree of Israel and not the other way around. For Chrysostom, Paul's key point in these discussions is to offer comfort to the Jews that indeed salvation is already among them, while at the same time ensuring that Gentiles do not become haughty and begin to think of themselves as better than the people of God. Chrysostom explains this way, quote, For that the Jews had sinned greatly, he would say, none will gainsay. But let us see if the fall is of such a kind as to be incurable and quite preclude their being set up again. But of such a kind, it is not. When the fullness of the Gentiles, he says, shall have come in, then all shall all Israel be saved at the time of his second coming at the end of the world. Yet this he does not say at once, lest in this way he should make a wall to bar their access to the faith and should further make believing Gentiles puffed up, end quote. Chrysostom now reiterates that if we do not understand that Paul's rhetorical object in Romans 11 is to help give solace to his beloved brethren, we will once again not be able to see how his arguments in these passages actually work. They will seem to seem to contradict themselves. Quote, observe how in the whole of the passage, one finds him working at this object, the wish to solace them. And if you deny it, many contradictions will follow, end quote. 
At the end of the day for Chrysostom, the point in it all is not to expect something from Paul that helps us to systematically describe a kind of schematic salvation, figuring out who precisely is saved, who precisely is not, or how being a Jew or anything else will impact that salvation. The point is to emulate what Paul is really trying to do in his writings here, to center ourselves on the love of all human beings and the work of drawing them closer to the love of and faith in Christ. Quote, for as he, Paul, has that treasure house of blessings, a loving and merciful soul, he will make it a fountain for all his brethren's needs and will enjoy all the rewards that are laid up with God. That we then may attain to these, let us of all things frame our souls accordingly. And to go off script here for just a moment, this was Richard Schneider, I think. We heard him compared earlier today to Barnabas, which was a lovely comparison as well. But what Chris Hofstam wants us to see in Paul, I saw every time I met Richard. Someone framing his soul, according to that great saint. For Chrysostom, then, St. Paul is anything but a systematic thinker, writing a treatise on human salvation in Romans 9 through 11. Instead, Paul is a man who has apprehended a deep and immutable truth about salvation in Christ, who senses the critical importance of such faith for all people. Paul does not, for Chrysostom, have the entirety of God's plan of salvation figured out. And yet, in Chrysostom's reading, this only highlights all the more fully the value of Paul's words. As a master rhetorician driven exclusively by his love of Christ and his fellow Jews, along with the Gentiles, Paul aims to pull us more fully into Christ's mystery and thus more fully into God's work of salvation. Richard taught me so much about reading this way, any author, Chrysostom, Paul, or anyone else. More importantly, I think, to cap off this day, I think he taught us all so much about actually living this way. I thank him, and I will forever thank him and remember him. Memory eternal. What a day. Thank you all. Thank you, friends, colleagues, students, friends new, friends old, all of us in some way connected to a great man. And so I want to offer all of you thanks, those who helped to pull this together, those who came out and made this a wonderful day. But above all, as Dan just said, thank you, Richard, for, for making this possible for all of us, really. And uh, there's not a moment of most days that goes by that I'm not thinking of Richard and still talking to him. <laughs> Didn't talk back quite so much, although he does. <laughs> but uh, it, it, I think he continues to, to live with us and, and to be, be with us.